everyone. Uh, as we have just been introduced, we are Olivia, Josh and Rosie, and we will be presenting the Modern Arctic Council for you. Before we get into our presentation, we would like to briefly introduce ourselves. So my name is Rosemary or Rosie. Um, I am a British citizen, but I am studying at Leiden University in the Netherlands. I am reading security studies. Um, apart from my studies, I have also taken part in a lot of MUN conferences, and I am also helping out with MUN Impact in some of their organizational things behind the scenes. And I am also um, helping organize our online model Arctic Council. Uh, I can go next. Um, I'm Olivia Silk, as it's already been mentioned. Um, I am a student at in Canada at Trent University, uh, and I am Canadian. I am studying uh, for my master's in Canadian and Indigenous Studies currently, and I became involved with Polar Aspect and Model Arctic Councils uh, through my school. Um, and that's where I met Anthony, so I wanted to bring this to you as well, right, for, and got involved with Polar Aspect, essentially. So on to Josh. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm from the United Kingdom. Um, I'm currently doing my first year of psychology degree at the University of Oxford. Um, I became involved in model diplomacy about two years ago, um, and I've done a wealth of different things, uh, Model United Nations, Model Arctic Council, Model US Senate, and um, both as a participant and a chair, including um, I chair, I was the secretary of the Norwich Model Arctic Council, which is one of the impolar Model Arctic, oh, sorry, the in-person Model Arctic Council was the Polar Aspect runs last year. So now that we've presented ourselves, we're going to get right into the presentation. So um, I would like you all to please close your eyes and envision the Arctic. Just whatever comes to mind. For example, you can now open your eyes and can you, did you envision one of these beautiful coastlines on the, for example, on the side of Norway? Or did you think of one of the people drilling oil, as is commonly referred, is shown in the news? However, there is more to the Arctic than this. For instance, um, did you think of a shopping centre where citizens of the Arctic go and do their shopping? Or like as some things simple as this sometimes don't come up in the um, in the way we think of the Arctic, or for example, I seem to, no, yeah. We seem to have lost control of the presentation. There we go. Oh, do you envision um, the Arctic people protesting about the high food cost that they are, since it is quite hard to get food up there, the price is excruciatingly high and thus people are then having to protest since they can't afford to buy basic necessities. You see, there isn't one specific Arctic. The Arctic is many things. There is the wilderness Arctic, the frontier Arctic, and the homeland Arctic. We always see in the pictures something more of the wilderness, you know, the beautiful coastlines or people drilling. However, there are people that live in the Arctic and these are often overlooked. You see, you might be surprised to know that uh, there are now over 4 million people that call the Arctic their home. Uh, in 2004, um, as we can see in the statistic, it was nearing 4 million, but um, as shown in recent censuses, it's now over 4 million. And because we don't think of these people, we often forget that there are many different human Arctics. These, everyone that lives in the Arctic is then sort of divided up by, you know, by the nation that they live in. And these then lack representation since they don't live in the mainland of where, you know, of, for instance, for Russia, we don't think that, you know, of the Sami council of the north of Russia. So they often lack representation and their needs. So as we can see here, um, the Arctic Council features some permanent participants where all these people get representation and can voice their opinions. See, global climate change is one of the things that this the mo has to be the most common thing we hear about the Arctic. You see, the Arctic is melting, the sea levels are rising. But the, there is 
truly more to it. It's a place where there are social and economic issues. You see, we don't listen to the people that live there. We listen to the politicians, the leaders of the nations of a whole. All these indigenous peoples who also have priorities, who are often different to the ones that are represented as a, at a national level. For instance, you see, they have issues such as um, limited access to public goods. They're, there's a lack of education that they are provided is not is often not up to the standards that we can that we see in more urban areas of the countries. There is also um, constraint in regards to how much physical and digital connectivity they have. It's a very area. It's an area where everyone is very spread out. They don't get as much interaction. And all these we can connect to the sustainable development goals. So we should really. Next time we see the article in the news, we should always think that there is more to the issue than only um, climate change, as all these issues are interconnected. If there's a fragile ecosystem, you know, the place where they're living, they'll have to live to narrower areas which are less um, connected to each other. Sorry, I had to quickly unmute there. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about. Uh, what is the Arctic Council? And I'm gonna I'm uh, I'm going to explain it all for you. So the Arctic Council is a high-level intergovernmental forum comprised of eight member states, uh, there to represent their respective um, stakes in Arctic territories, and six indigenous organizations or permanent participants, as they're also known, uh, who are there to represent and advocate for themselves, the primary uh, inhabitants of the Arctic, and uh, and to represent their ancestral homelands. So. Uh, the Arctic, eight Arctic states include Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. Um, uh, the, every Arctic state uh, gets a chance to host and chair the council as the role is rotated every two years. Um, and the permanent participants include the Arctic Athabaskan Ca Council, Aleut International Association, Gwich'in Council International, Inuit Circumpolar Council, Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North and the Sami Council, which are represented on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. Uh, these states and organizations are included and represented in the council because of their existence in, this, uh, in the surrounding Arctic region. Those that do not have territory in the Arctic, um, uh, do not have territory in the Arctic, but are involved in Arctic matters can be present as observers um, and have the ability to work uh, with the council's working groups if applicable. Uh, and this is represented on the graphic as the gray circle surrounding uh, the graphics representing working groups and Arctic states and everything. So um, the Arctic Council's six working groups are responsible for implementing projects uh, mandated by the council in their official declaration at the conclusion of council meetings. The six working groups have their own respective goals, which are fairly self-explanatory for the, for the, from their names. So that includes ACAP, the Arctic Contaminants Action Program, AMAP, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, CAF, Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, EPPR, Emergency Prevention and Preparedness Response, uh, PAME, which is Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment, and SDWG, which is the Sustainable Development Working Group. Each group has its own mandate from the council through which they each manage their own assigned projects collaboratively with Arctic experts with a wide range of backgrounds and expertise. So the Ottawa Declaration is the agreement that established the Arctic Council. This document promotes the cooperation and collaboration between Arctic states as well as permanent participants. In establishing the council, this declaration marks the formation of an incredibly unique approach to diplomacy. Firstly, Indigenous peoples were integral to the formation of the Arctic Council. The representation and consultation is key when discussing Arctic matters. Um, they know their homes better than anyone, and their consultation supports the, co uh, the cooperative and collaborative nature of the Council when solving Arctic issues. This also ensures that the permanent participants can openly advocate for themselves um, in an internationally recognized forum. Uh, and secondly, the council requires full consensus amongst member states when making decisions in order to support the council's focus on a connected and collaborative Arctic. 
This requires all parties to work together to achieve their respective and collective goals. Without consensus, there is no declaration, thus no progress. This is the incentive for members, participants, and observers alike. This is what makes the Council such a unique international forum. Um, so finding consensus is not easy. The, this result requires uh, negotiation, very, uh, and the very nature of the Council requires this difficult task to be completed in order for a, fi uh, a final declaration to be unanimously agreed upon. The goal is to achieve diplomatic success through constructive negotiation, which requires efforts to persuade, collaborate, and cooperate with all parties involved. The Arctic Council is not Arctic government. The Council is intergovernmental. The focus of the Council is policy shaping by working together uh, to achieve a satisfactory result for all involved. Uh, this way, working groups and governments uh, can work to actively shape policy opposed to making it. This allows for many freedoms when negotiating in future and allows for the constant stream of data and knowledge to be considered further as we are constantly learning more about this unique and rapidly changing place. Um, so um, the Arctic Council fosters this environment of cooperation, collaboration through five types of work specifically. Um, this includes agreements, cooperation, and cooperation data and knowledge, monitoring, assessments, and recommendations. Uh, agreements and cooperation represent the established and ongoing effort of the Council to remain co uh, cooperative and collaborative through discussion of common concerns for the Arctic as a region with full Indigenous involvement and consultation on such matters. This is the constant and ongoing effort from all parties to agree to and maintain relationships and unanimity um, when approaching issues in the region. Uh, the collection of data and knowledge continues to be an integral part of the Council's framework. Collecting and generating this data and knowledge allows for trends, issues, and solutions to be measured and considered by the Council. Um, and a few examples of the reported data or knowledge projects featured by the Arctic Council include uh, circumpolar biodiversity monitoring, uh, circumpolar oil spill response viability analysis, uh, Arctic shipping traffic data, just to name a few things. There's so many different um, approaches and so many different pieces to the Arctic that we require so much uh, detail. And this is a way of really mapping it out and getting the knowledge out there and continuing to foster that. Um, and the knowledge and data is often collected and generated by various scientists, governments, conservation groups, indigenous organizations um, assigned by the council to specific working groups. Uh, indigenous involvement is uh, key to, to their firsthand experience, like I already mentioned, um, and, uh, and their knowledge of the, the land environment and their history. Um, so, and then the Arctic Council's efforts in monitoring are meant to further expand Arctic knowledge base um, and to collect data over a long period of time. Monitoring allows for Arctic states and working groups to manage and maintain their work and strategy uh, and to build upon it. This is especially important in developing knowledge in a, of a rapidly changing Arctic. Uh, assessments are produced by the six working groups of the Arctic Council. The purpose of these assessments is to bring Arctic issues to the forefront to be considered by the Council, and the assessments are designed to inform the Council on new or ongoing issues, uh, uh, as well as findings, projects, or efforts in the Arctic. And finally, the knowledge and work generated by the Council's working groups results in recommendations to the Council officials and ministers. These recommendations are the basis for informed decision making on the part of the Council as they continue to build upon their generated and constantly expanding knowledge base. Um, so the Arctic Council in its 24 years of existence um, has, has constantly uh, contributed greatly to the expansion of Arctic knowledge and this knowledge helps to inform decision-making. Um, and returning to the point of negotiation being key to, cons uh, to reaching consensus, the Arctic Council has negotiated three legally binding agreements in the past 10 years, all of which focus on maintaining and improving upon cooperation in the North. Um, these legally binding agreements can be seen on the right side of the screen, hand side, and um, 
However, legally binding agreements are not the norm or overarching goal of the Council. Other successes of the Council include the Arctic Offshore Oil and Gas Guidelines, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, the Arctic Human Development Report, uh, and so on. Uh, these are incredibly influential documents as they are devoted to knowledge and best practices in the Arctic uh, that the Council will utilize, share, implement, uh, and further build upon in future. So, um, to look closer at how the Arctic issue approaches issues, um, I want to talk to you quickly about the One Arctic, One Health project. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so, what is the, the One Arctic, One Health project? It's one of the projects like Olivia talked about and um, was launched by the Sustainable Development Working Group in 2015. Um, and the idea of it is to promote health and well-being and a better understanding of that within the Arctic. Um, the project has had three chairs, the, the chairs of the, the SDWG, at various points and it is currently ongoing until the next ministerial meeting next year um, but it could potentially be extended further. Could I have the next slide? Um, so the, the main principle of the project is a holistic approach to human health um, and what this means is not just looking at health as a human problem but understanding how human interactions with the environment and the animals around can, can contribute to, to health impacts on humans and how uh, the impacts of those and how studying and mitigating the impacts on the environment and the animals can better help improve human health. Um, the project is multidisciplinary. Um, Again, it's about not just looking at health from a medical perspective, but understanding it from a, a much broader perspective. And it brings in experts from many different scientific disciplines to study not just things like access to medicine and pathogens, but also um, the changes in, say, animal distribution, because that's going to affect the food chain and the quality and availability of food. Um, things like how drinking water is affected by climate change and other factors, um, environmental contamination, so um, things like mercury have been a big issue moving up into Arctic waters and quite a lot of the contaminants that are, are faced in the Arctic are actually generated elsewhere in the world and then move up. And um, yeah, a, a good example of how of how looking at it from a holistic perspective is beneficial is by studying climate change we can better understand how the permafrost in the arctic melts which is releasing um you know thousands of year old pathogens that have been trapped and frozen below the ice and that humans no longer have the the right immunity to and can have devastating effects so by understanding how that's melting and how the permafrost, the permafrost is boring uh, we can understand perhaps better the pathogens that are likely to be coming out and how we can deal with them. So the project's two primary goals are acquiring the knowledge that they need and transferring that into something effective. Um, so acquiring the knowledge is takes form of surveys and studies and likewise conducted by universities and conservation groups um, like Olivia mentioned earlier and the idea is to broaden our understanding of all of the different factors that go into impacting health in the Arctic. Um, the, the other goal is building capacity to deal with the health challenges that arise um, from that um, and this takes many many forms um, 
tabletop discussions, so bringing experts and interested parties together and discussing and coming up with solutions is one thing. Um, the One Health One, uh, sorry, the One Arctic One Health Project has seen many scientific articles uh, published to try and educate and broaden our understanding of of the health effects facing the Arctic. Um, another primary goal is by the end of the project, by the completion date, currently 2021, uh, the idea is to have some sort of online forum or online platform with lots of information about stuff to be wary of and different uh, methods that can be used to mitigate risks and have that widely accessible to all the peoples living in the Arctic. Um, so having that as a platform there to try and improve and maintain human health going forward is one of the, the key goals of the project. Um, there is, and one of the defining features um, coming from the Arctic Council is a strong emphasis on the Indigenous peoples and how they can benefit the the project um, and this takes two main forms. Um, number one, the indigenous peoples have a much better, you know, long history of understanding of the land that they live on and how the animals and fauna, uh, sorry, the flora work and exist in that habitat. And we can use that knowledge along with modern surveying techniques, but that knowledge can then inform us as to whether this is a, a one-off uh, event that we're witnessing or we've surveyed or whether it's part of perhaps a more dangerous pattern going forward. So having that knowledge to take the raw data and interpret it in a meaningful way is something that can only be done with um, the collaboration of the Indigenous people. Another important role they bring to the project is I uh, the the elders and the the those in uh, leadership positions within local communities um, take are are have a, such a respected position and can communicate what is what is discovered and what is um, discussed by the project and communicate that to their communities in a way that improves trust and helps the knowledge get to the people that need access to that knowledge. Um, so what role does the Arctic Council and specifically the SDWG play in, in the project? Well, it kind of takes four main roles um, and it, it has general oversight of the project. It's overseen and managed centrally by the SDWG and the SDWG then report uh, on how the project is doing up to the, the senior Arctic officials, which is the, the civil servants from the member states and the permanent participants, and finally up to the, the, the foreign ministries and the ministerial meeting, which is when all the foreign ministers get together. Um, it organises some of the logistics, so a lot of events such as the tabletop discussions and uh, lectures and the, the like are run concurrently with other Arctic Council events. Um, this minimises travel and disruption and makes sure you've got all the interested parties, if they're in the one place already, um, this is, it makes it a lot logistically easier. Um, the Arctic Council can also help subsidise the travel for uh, those that might not be able to afford or have longer distances to travel. Um, they encourage the funding. So uh, as, as is the rule in the Arctic Council, the Arctic Council doesn't have a budget to enact its own, its own decisions. It requires on Arctic states volunteering, uh, Arctic states and other parties volunteering to, to fund and run the projects. Um, again, this, these overheads are kept down by running a lot of the events. Uh, alongside other other Arctic Council events. And finally, uh, it aids in the collaboration. Uh, the Arctic Council is a already established body that can provide 
platforms for the collaboration, um, has you know the forum and the, the the place where people can come together, and as I mentioned earlier, can collate the research and help get the research published and distributed so that people can learn from it. Um, and the Arctic Council is involved in a lot of similar projects. This is not a one-off project. As um, Olivia hinted at earlier, the, there is a huge number of different projects across a huge number of disciplines and a range of issues that the Arctic Council is involved in. This here is just a very, very small selection of them. Um, so as you can see, they're the projects span everything from uh, contamination to uh, plastic, uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity, um, then there's others on meteorology and shipping and indigenous issues. The, the Arctic Council uh, undertakes at any one time a huge range of different projects aimed at improving the lives of those that live in the Arctic and improving collaboration uh, between different interested parties. Um, and so coming back round to why, why I'm talking about this today, um, One Arctic, One Health is emblematic of how the Arctic Council operates. It's policy shaping. This hasn't been dictated or forced upon anyone. It is a a project aimed at acquiring knowledge and uh, discussing solutions which different parties can uh, take the relevant bits from and implement on their own, in their own territories and as is best appropriate for them. Um, it provides the impetus for cooperation but doesn't control or dictate. Um, and again, yeah, it's its aim is to acquire knowledge and help shape policy, not dictate policy to people. Um, it's consensus. It has three different chairs and uh, the United States, Canada and now Finland have all continued the project um, in, a, in a very collaborative way. Again, no state has been forced to accept this or participate, nor will they be at the end of this, a big list of demands that is forced upon anyone. The whole idea is that all parties are consensually involved in this. Um, there is huge amounts of Indigenous involvement. As I, as I talked about earlier, uh, the Indigenous peoples play a fundamental role and um, knowledge not only is shared from the Indigenous communities, but then back to um, this is one of the key, the key ideas of the Arctic Council, this involvement of Indigenous peoples. Um, and finally, again, the collaboration. Um, the, the project is run by, while it's overseen by the Arctic Council and specifically the SDWG, it's organised collaboratively at Arctic states, Indigenous communities, uh, universities are heavily involved. So the University of the Arctic has undertaken a number of surveys and uh, tabletops and hosted tabletop discussions. Um, University of Northern Iowa is again involved in this, um, and has been at various points. And the, the Arctic Council brings together these governments and uh, these interest groups and the universities and the charities and the indigenous people and is a forum by which all of these people can come together and, you know, best use their combined knowledge to help make the Arctic a better place. So, how can you get involved? So, you can, through Model Arctic Council, you can play the role of an Arctic diplomat in a real, discussing real issues. As we can see on these pictures here, on the left, we have the um, senior Arctic officials meeting uh, that took place in Norwich and um, the structure of the room uh, resembles the one the picked on the right, which is the Arctic Council senior Arctic officials meeting that took place in Finland in November. This, uh, these pictures show a very clear comparison and of how truly similar this experience is.
while um, MUN is very similar to Model Arctic Council, there are some there are four key differences that um, I'll be discussing with you today. So firstly, as my colleagues have previously mentioned, it works on consensus. All decisions that um, all decisions that are made have to be made by consensus by the Arctic states. These include the procedural and the substantive decisions. This means that they choose whether they want to go forward with these uh, the resolutions or if it also they also discuss the content of them as well. They can decide, you know, if they want to put a paragraph in or leave it as a whole sentence, for example. Secondly, there is collaboration. Because of the consensus, there has to be collaboration between um, throughout the negotiation and the problem solving areas. There are no pre-prepared declarations or there's no lobbying for signatures as we are used to in MUN. You show up there with your ideas, you've done your research, of course, and you understand the way your state or whoever you're representing. And then you collaborate, you lobby with people. You can do, and the thing is, you do this both formally and informally. There are designated times, but also you do this, you know, when you go out for your lunch or when you're having like a break. These are times where you are encouraged to take a step forward and discuss with your peers what they think and slowly and steadily build a consensus and a general idea of what their discussions are going to achieve. Next, we have the Indigenous peoples and their rights. In addition to the states, we can also keep students also play Indigenous peoples. These are incredibly um, interesting things to research since they are very small uh, groups of people that we don't hear about often. And doing the research can actually provide uh, more of an, a more overview of the way a state runs. For instance, if we learn about one of the indigenous groups, this allows us to understand more of a general idea of how the economics of an area works or how developed truly developed the whole nation is. Lastly, is the focus. As the name hints, uh, this, um, these conferences have a focus on Arctic issues. This, since it's such a specific area, this allows for in-depth engagement with one of the most important regions. There are small, um, intimate conferences where you discuss in-depth issues. So we can he see here some of the uh, testimonials from uh, previous conferences that have been held. Both, it, it clearly shows how both delegates and teachers have enjoyed them previously. Um, and the fact that they have allowed for, for students to develop their, you know, this public speaking confidence or their ability to negotiate. So you can join us for the first ever online Model Arctic Council delegate training. So we will be offering this training and we'll be covering issues such as the Arctic, the Arctic Council, as well as researching and writing declarations and consensus building. All these um, issues are very specific uh, to, the, to the Model Arctic Council, but they can also be applied to more general areas. You know, we all have to do research for school or consensus building is actually uh, very useful in um, MUN, since the style is different, but you do have to, you know, get people to agree with you and you have to be willing to adapt and present your ideas clearly. This training will be taking part across four Saturdays from November 7th to November 28th, and we will finish with a max simulation. That way you will be able to, you know, experience what this kind of debate looks like and, you know, put all the information you've gained into practice. Thank you to MEN Impact, since we are now able to, um, you know, we'll be using their platforms uh, to host this conference. And um, after this, we will be hosting our first ever on full online conference, which is for secondary school pupils. It's one of its own, it's only, it's the only one of its kind in the world today. It's, it's currently planned for one of the early, an uh, early weekend in February, and there'll be uh, one session on a Friday, on a Saturday, and a second session on a Sunday. The conference will be hosted on Microsoft Teams, since this will allow for informal and uh, collaboration and negotiation through the different channels that can be created.
This means that you can join us from anywhere in the world. So if you're a high school student, um, please uh, join us. Uh, there's the links in the, in the slides, or, or, which you can copy, or I'm sure they'll be sent in the, uh, the meeting chat now. So you can go ahead and search for them and you know, do your research and hopefully join us. The registration for the conference uh, will be opening in due course. However, the registration for the training is now open. So if you are interesting, interested, please go ahead and um, register. If you have any questions about anything we've said, please feel free to ask us. We'll be more than happy to help. Um, thank you so much, uh, presenters. That was a wonderful and very, very informative uh, presentation. Uh, we will now be taking questions. So any participants who might have uh, any questions, you can either raise your hands and then we'll recognize you or you can drop your questions in the uh, chat uh, box that you can find. We've got one question in the chat asking, is the training free? Uh, the training is definitely free um please yes there's no cost associated with the training yep. if you have any more questions participants uh, uh let me remind you once again there are two options you can either drop your questions or you can raise your hands i uh, i see one more question um what is the difference between the training and the conference do you need the training prog uh, program or saturday meetings to do the conference uh, no, you don't. Um, we do recommend that you do them just if you don't have prior uh, Model Arctic Council experience. But if you are unable to make it or you feel confident enough already to just jump straight in the conference, you can do so. Agreed. I see one more question. In what grades do you have to be to participate in the training and conference? Um, so it's open to all high school students, so up to the age of 18. Um, we would usually say that um, it's more aimed at pupils towards the older end of that spectrum, but that there's no, if you're confident and are up for it, then there, there's, no, there's no minimum requirement there. I also would like to add, I think it would be beneficial for uh, people that are younger to do the training program, at least even if they don't wanna do the conference to get some background, it would be beneficial for anybody really, especially if you plan to go into this, um, this kind of thing. Okay, uh, someone was asking, is there a limited size and can you have a team of delegates for a single delegation? So in reference to the size, the training does not have a size. And for the conference, each delegation um, usually starts with one delegate and can usually go up to like three or four. So in that sense, there are there is a limited, but there's also the observers of the Arctic Council. So they while they don't get a full on say, they also have, you know, they also have to do their research and know what the issues are being discussed. So every there is a limit however um, there are um, part there are participants who aren't necessarily members themselves of the art account um, somebody asked do participants need to live in countries which are part of the arctic council absolutely not you can be from anywhere um, to be a part of our training or our conference um, and there's another question about whether we'll have more training sessions. Um, we're certainly planning to. We haven't yet got a date in the die, but we're certainly hoping that our both our training sessions and our conferences uh, will be able to run um, multiple times each each year. And so, oh. Also, just for information and for about the train for the training sessions, you can follow any of our social medias, email us, anything. So here's all our information if you guys want to write that down at all. And we can also send it in the chat if you'd like. Someone's asked, is the conference one day or across multiple days? Um, the conference will be across two days, um, about a three hour session on each day in the, the middle of the day UTC. So to be as inclusive. Uh, 
time zones as possible. We still have time for a few more questions. So participants, if you still have any questions, you can bring them up right now. Uh, my apologies. I've just been told that uh, we won't be simulating observers. So there will be a, a limited capacity for the conference. Um, however, the, the delegations can expand or you know have less delegates depending on how much demand there is. There's a question about the timing of the training uh, from Catherine. So uh, at the moment, we don't have a set time. However, uh, as per the conference, we will be hosting it at a time inclusive um, times a time so that uh, regardless of where you feel on the UTC uh, time, you can have a general idea. Uh, at the moment, we are looking at um, from four till six at UTC, just to ensure that you know people can join from anywhere in the world. All right, we have one more question from uh, Ariana. She asks, can three people from one school represent one delegation at the conference? Um, they certainly can. Uh, sorry, we shall, but on as when you go to sign up, there will be a, a question asking whether you have a preference and we shall do our best to try and accommodate any preferences you may have. 